Born Too Late for the Battle of Kursk or Born Just in Time for the Battle of Kursk? Well, today we're going to talk a little about Kursk and the two different battles that have taken place there that are on the forefront of everyone's mind. Obviously, the first Battle of Kursk took place in 1943, but the current Battle of Kursk taking place in 2024 is getting a lot of attention right now because it's the first time that Kursk has been invaded by a opposing force since the Germans in 1943. The incursion into Kursk has led to the evacuation of over 120,000 civilians, according to what Russian authorities have said. The big difference between what's going on in Kursk and what's been going on throughout the rest of the Ukrainian war is that there was like a shock to this. It was like a blitz, if you will. And the reason why I say that is because the speed, the size, and the intensity that the Ukrainians rolled in there to do this almost overnight. About 10,000 Ukrainian troops are involved, according to a lot of different military analysts and that's that's including like american procured equipment that they're using it's including german procured equipment that they're using utilizing HIMARS to launch missiles for precision strikes on bridges to cut off supply lines and cut off reinforcement ability to the russian military there has been a lot of aggressive movement over the past week nobody even expected this type of attack into russian territory from ukraine because they were very airtight with their intelligence they kept it very close to the chest. Apparently, Russia's emergency situations ministry said that approximately 10,000 of the evacuees from the Kursk region, including 3,000 children, are staying in 171 different accommodation centers throughout the country to stay while they wait for things to calm down. Just this past Wednesday, Ukraine captured 102 Russian soldiers in a single day, which is a record number for them. Ukraine has yet to reveal how many POWs they've captured so far with this latest incursion, but it's a lot. Now, in my mind, I think they're probably doing this to use it as leverage to see if they can release that territory back to Russia, if Russia is willing to secede some of their territory that they've taken during this two years of conflict we've seen since 2022. So they've got a lot of soldiers that are POWs now. They've captured a bunch of territory. I would imagine they're probably trying to get Russia to pull out of certain areas in the eastern part of Ukraine and cede some of that territory or possibly use this as a peace talks type of thing. From what I'm hearing, over 80 different settlements inside of the Kursk region have been captured by Ukrainian forces during this incursion. I've also seen a HIMARS get destroyed that was about eight kilometers from the border of Ukraine. A HIMARS that was you know, provided to them from the United States. I've only seen a couple videos of that happen. So that's that's a very costly loss. So far as it stands right now, Kiev currently controls about 1,152 kilometers, square kilometers of Russian territory, which is a fair amount. That's very difficult to control or to maintain. Meanwhile, Russia is continuing their air assault on Ukraine using drones and missiles, like ballistic missiles, sometimes short range, sometimes long range. And it's interesting seeing some of the photos that have come out of this. Like, for example, artillery bombardment has blown massive chunks out of Vladimir Lenin statues that are out there. And tons of like historic sites have been littered with bullet holes and things like that. Now, one of the most ironic things about this incursion entirely is the fact that there's been photos and video footage of German martyr fighting vehicles, which are like an infantry fighting vehicle, an armored infantry fighting vehicle in Kursk that were given and provided to the Ukrainians. The most interesting thing about that is Germany actually tried to attack and invade Kursk during World War II. Now the German Martyr II was actually an anti-tank vehicle. It was a tank destroying vehicle that was used during World War II when the original Battle of Kursk took place in 1943. It's not a very commonly talked about battle. It was the biggest tank battle in history like over 6,000 armored vehicles and tanks participated in this battle. Germany alone attacked with 2,700 tanks and mobile assault guns. I mean, it was, it was massive. So let's backtrack. We're going to backtrack to 1943, July 5th specifically. Now, the Battle of Kursk, like I said, took place July 5th and it lasted until August 23rd of 1943. Now, the original reason that Germany was even fighting in Russia was because of Operation Barbosa, which was Germany's invasion of Russia. Now, in the middle of World War II, Russia was taking territories or like threatening their neighbors and Adolf Hitler at the time was getting wary and paranoid that if Russia took over enough territories that they would unite against them. So he preemptively decided that they were gonna invade Russia, try to cripple them before they were able to mass forces 
and that way he wouldn't be threatened. By the time it was the winter of 1943, Germany and Russia had reached like an impasse. They were stuck. They were frozen. There's a slight bulge in the line that was called, they referred to it as a salient. It was essentially like the center of this disputed area in Russia called Kursk. This bulge in the defensive line where, they, where everyone was staged was about 150 miles north to south and 100 miles from east to west. And at the center of that bulge was the Russian city of Kursk. Now, this bulge became known as the Kursk bulge, and it was a strategic location for Germany. One of the big reasons why it was a strategic position was because Hitler wanted to be able to control Kursk's railways and their roads, which was a vital point for supply chains. Now, by March of 1943, they crushed the Russian resistance over at Belgorod and Kharkov, later on called Kharkiv, which was south near the Kursk bulge. German Field Marshal Erich von Manstein wanted to take advantage of the momentum that they had gained from the previous battles and attempt to seize Kursk proper. Now, at the time, the Wehrmacht, which was Germany's military forces, chose to prepare for a later campaign at the bulge. And so they ended up losing that momentum. Now, over the course of the next couple months leading up to July, when they began the actual invasion, Germany amassed 500,000 men, 10,000 guns, and mortars, also 2,700 tanks, 2,700 tanks, and 2,500 aircraft in order to mount this attack on the Kursk bulge. Now, the problem is, is all that time and all that troop movement, the Soviets were able to surmise what was coming. So they were able to prepare for this attack. Now, the Red Army ended up digging in and amassed a, like, a massive amount of people. They had 1,300,000 men with over 20,000 guns and mortars, 3,600 tanks, and 2,600 50 aircraft. They also had five reserve field armies and another half a million men and 1,500 additional tanks. Now, north of the Kursk bulge was Germany's 9th Army, which was made up of three panzer divisions and over 300,000 men. At the south was their 4th Panzer Army, which had over 300,000 men. And they also had a combination of Panther and Tiger tanks. Now, to the west was Germany's 2nd Army, which had about 110,000 men. By the time Operation Citadel, which is what they were naming the invasion of Kursk, Operation Citadel, by the time it was taking place, both sides were strapped to the gills. They were ready to go. And a big thing that the Russians did to prepare for this was they laid out a crap ton of anti-vehicle and anti-tank mines all over the battlefield in preparation for the massive amount of tanks that Germany was bringing to bear. Now, Hitler's generals had warned him that he needed to cancel Operation Citadel because they knew that the Russians were prepared for this and were heavily entrenched and fortified in their positions. And he's, he decided, no, we're going to go ahead and do this. We're going to go ahead and push forward with this. The original start date for this was supposed to be May 3rd, but like I said, they pushed it to July 5th, mainly because he wanted to wait for better weather, and he also wanted to wait for the delivery of the new and improved Panther and Tiger tanks that they, they had available, even though they had never been field tested up to that point. Russia had laid out tons of tank traps, anti-tank mines, anti-personnel mines. Apparently, they, they had thrown out tons of barbed wire all over the place, nearly 1 million anti personnel and anti-tank mines. That's unreal. They also had a lot of help from Kursk civilians who were local Russians. So they were like, yeah, we're going to, we'll help, you know, reinforce this stuff and dig stuff. So they dug a vast network of trenches that was at least 2,500 miles, which is insane. I can't even imagine doing that by hand. Now, because Germany was used to blitzkrieg tactics and they worked because like surprise and momentum like crushed everybody. They didn't have the the element of surprise with this, nor did they have speed or momentum because they had been slowly massing troops and the Russians were able to prepare for this. Now, additionally, on top of the fact that the Soviets were aware of what the Germans were doing, the British intelligence were able to crack the German secret code for their communication systems, and they were regularly passing information to the Soviets to prepare them better for their assaults. Now, in the early morning hours of July 5th, before Germany attacked, the Soviets Soviets unleashed a massive bombardment on the fields that surrounded the Kursk bulge in an attempt to like delay the offensive. It ended up delaying the Germans about an hour and a half, but it didn't have any severe impact. And then right after that, Germany countered with their own artillery assault, which they launched it on the northern and the southern part of this bulge. Now, the Russian ground defenses in the north part of the bulge prevented German tanks from making much headway due to the fact that they were heavily armored and heavily entrenched in that area. So by July 10th, they had completely halted the 9th Army 
Army's northern advance. In the south, it was a little bit different because the Germans had a little bit more success down there because they had just like fought their way through. They ended up making their way to the small settlement of Prokhorovka, which is about 50 miles southeast of Kursk. They ended up clashing with the Russia's Fifth Guards tank army. At the time, Russia suffered huge losses, but they still managed to defeat the Germans from or prevent them from capturing Prokhorovka and breaching their third defensive belt that was there. And that pretty much like stopped the German offensive in its tracks. Now, this is this is all considered the Battle of Kursk because that that was what they were trying to invade. However, the Battle of Prokhorovka is actually often referred to as the largest tank battle in history. At the same time, while this is happening on July 10th, Allied troops landed on the beach of Sicily, which forced Hitler to abandon Operation Citadel and reroute his panzer divisions to Italy in order to like prevent any additional Allied landings there. They also attempted to do a smaller offensive in the south known as Operation Roland, but that was ineffective because the Red Army pushed them back within a few days. After that, the Soviets launched a counteroffensive, Operation Kutuzov, north of Kursk on July 12th. And they smashed through the German lines at the the Orel salient. And then by July 24th, the Germans were on the run completely and had been completely routed. Now, it's estimated that up to 800,000 Soviet casualties ta were taking place there as a result of, like, the, the nitty-gritty defense of the area compared to about 200,000 German casualties. And they were never able to regain their momentum on the Eastern Front after their loss there because they lost a lot. In any case, the point of all this is to say that you may have been born too late to fight in the original Battle of Kursk in a German martyr, but you're also right on time to fight in the Battle of Kursk in a German martyr. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. If you think there's something else that's interesting about this incursion that's going on right now that you think other people would find interesting as well, please share it with us. I would love to hear what everyone has to say. I personally think this is going to end up being a, a bartering token, and I think that's the reason they're doing it, because they, they probably do want this war to end just as much as anyone else does at this point, because they've lost so many of their youth. Um, at this point, I don't know if they can continue this kind of a thing going back and forth because it's been a vicious slog for them. I think they're trying to get to a point where they have a bartering chip, but they could also be just testing out the German defenses to see how they fare in areas that they weren't necessarily prepared for an attack from. And obviously you saw it was like a blitz. It was very quick and the momentum was very fast and they're still there, you know, hooking and jabbing. So we'll have to see how this thing plays out, but I hope you enjoyed the video and we'll see you in the next one.